we're going to use the phrase hope for the nations, and you're going to hear shortly and understand, I hope, how hope came to the Galatians. And, uh, but before uh, I start, we must pray, so let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the proclamation of your word through songs, through prayer, and now through your word. And I ask for your blessing upon the preaching of it. I pray that you would set aside anything in each of us that would distract us from hearing from you. And let us hear your words that may we, we may come to know you and ourselves better this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I'll be, uh, the, the text, main text for this morning is Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, which has been uh, derived from one of the two scriptures that support the Belgic Confession, artic, uh, Belgic Confession Article 17. And for a little background, in case uh, some of you don't know, uh, Pastor Josh introduced that a number of weeks ago when he started the series on the Belgic Confession. But the Belgic Confession, uh, what, what is it and why is it important to the Christian Reformed Church? Well, the Reformation found its beginning in 1517, thanks largely to Martin Luther. Who, and this caused a schism between the Reformers and the Catholic Church. The Belgic Confession, which was written in 1561, owes its origin to the need for a clear and comprehensive statement of the Reformed faith. So here is Article 17. We believe that our good God, by marvelous divine wisdom and goodness, seeing that Adam and Eve had plunged themselves in this manner, and in this manner he's referring to, or we're referring to Article 16, which talks about the ruin and the fall of man. So plunge themselves in this manner into both physical and spiritual death and made themselves completely miserable. God sent out to find them, though they, trembling all over, were fleeing from God. God comforted them, promising to give them his son, born of a woman, to crush the head of the serpent and to make them blessed. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Uh, the setting of this statement is immediately after that first sin and the fall. God addresses the serpent, who is Satan, first. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And then also from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Now, the point of any sermon is to take Scripture and point to Jesus, the Lamb of God to whom we owe everything and is worthy of our worship, our praise, for dying for us and paying the price for all of our sin. So to those of us who have been around the Christian block a few times, what I've just read is, simple, is a simple and shut case. The offspring of the woman is Jesus, who has definite enmity with all things evil, when the time was right, he came into the world, sent by God the Father, born of the Virgin Mary, crushed Satan's head, and conquered death. That's it, sermon over. <laughs> but no. That may be the skeleton of the story and the heart of it, 
But with every body, there's a lot more to it than just the skeleton. And there's so much more for us to learn from the things that surround the skeleton of this story because the word of God is rich and full of lessons for us. So we have time, we'll dig deeper. We'll look at how the set time had fully come to the world, to the Galatians, and to you. Let's start by asking this question. Why did it take God the Father almost 4,000 years to send his son to redeem us from this spiritual death and crush the enemy? Why didn't God send a savior right away and fix this mess? Right the wrong, limit the damage. Okay, so the world's broken. Here's the fix. Jesus born to Eve to be the guide for all of earth to see, to know, and to follow. Why did it have to take so long? Well, the world had to go through a bunch of stuff first to really come to know its need for him. For starters, his chosen people, the Israelites, had every advantage to be what God wanted for and from his people. They failed miserably because they were sinners. God was demonstrating that given every opportunity and advantage, not even his chosen people could live up to his standards and expectations. Even they, not to mention everyone else, needed God to intervene and provide a way. The time became right because in the historical setting at the time of Jesus' birth, life and death, after the Hellenization of much of the Near Eastern world, at the time of the Roman Empire, the social environment, lost my spot, the social environment, that is, good roads that went everywhere, common language all over the empire, and the economic interchange from region to region was ideally suited to and for the spread of the gospel. In addition, like one of those good roads, the prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Hosea, and others stood like markers along the way those who would look back would see and know by faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who came to crush the serpent's head and conquer death through his own death and subsequent resurrection. God had a sequence set out for the arrival of his Redeemer. You see, he made a promise to us, but we couldn't handle the promise right away. Instead, he builds relationship with us. He takes his people and walks them and walks with them through year after year after year, through failure after failure after failure. His forgiveness and restoration given freely after each failure. He gave them his words through the law and his prophets to make and reinforce the promises that he made. Now there were some who saw and understood and lived in that hope. Hope builds faith. And this all had to happen so that when the time came and the promise was delivered, they could be ready for it and receive it and handle it. This waiting is reinforced in scripture. Here are a few examples. Lamentations. Lamentations 3, 25 to 27 says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. And in Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his words I put my hope. And then there's Ecclesiastes 3, in which God says through Solomon that there is a time for everything. Okay, time for another question. 
What is there to learn about the context of this passage as it relates to the Galatians? Of the 13 letters in the New Testament that were written by the Apostle Paul, four were written to persons and nine were to churches. Rome, Galatia, Ephesus, Colossae, Philippi, and to Corinth and Thessalonica who received two letters each. Galatia is the only one of those that was not a city, but a region. It was a province of the Roman Empire that was roughly one-fifth the size of modern-day Turkey. So a very large region that included the towns of Sidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, which all figure prominently in Acts chapters 13 and 14. And there were multiple, likely many churches there, not just one. And to clarify, these are home churches, not church buildings. And here's a little history. While the Galatian area was long inhabited by sparse villages, its population greatly increased when the area was invaded around 300 BC by Celtic Gauls. Gauls were called in Latin, Galli, hence Galatia. By the time the Romans conquered the area around 180 BC, the Galatians were bands of barbarians, mercenaries, and pillagers. They had become allies first to the short-lived Seleucid Empire and then to the Roman Empire as their mercenary skills were of use to Caesar. These are not salt of the earth kind of people, although there were some farmers, I'm sure. But their overall identity was that of being hard, calloused, and brutal, wreaking havoc for their survival. Spiritually, they had adopted the worship of the god Sabazios, an all-powerful horseman of the heavens, who overcame and dominated Sibeli, the original goddess of the region, who was deemed the great mother of gods, was the goddess of motherhood, fertility, and agriculture. Not a very manly god, was she? So here we have a picture of a fallen people, as fallen as can be created, greedy, violent, and merciless. And yet, this is a region in which the Apostle Paul traveled extensively in his three missionary journeys between 46 and 57 AD. In Acts chapter 13, Paul presents the gospel of Jesus to them. In the city in Antioch, on the first Sabbath, a few were encouraged. That's in verse 42. The second Sabbath, almost the whole city showed up. That's in verse 44. And the word of the Lord spread through the whole region in verse 49. They were ready to hear the message. Because unbeknownst to them, God, through the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, had been preparing the way in their lives and hearts without their knowing it. They had been primed to hear the good news. Paul spent large amounts of time here preaching and teaching Jesus as Savior. God converted the hearts of the people who then banded together to form these home churches that were scattered through the region. Now God has all of history, all people on his mind and on his heart at all times. God had decided that now was the time for Galatia, as it was for all of the Gentiles, to hear the gospel message. The beauty of this is that there was nothing they had to do to earn this message that they were included in the saving grace of Jesus. All they had to do was wait, even though they didn't know they were waiting. They were just getting on with life. And one day, here comes this guy named Paul who brought them a message of hope, redemption, and eternal life. 
on a day predetermined by God, that message came to them. They had, they had to do nothing to earn this salvation. There wasn't, Paul didn't go and say, okay, y'all need to shape up a bit before you accept Jesus. Or you guys get your lives in order and stop raiding and pillaging and then we're gonna talk. No, Paul comes, preaches Jesus crucified and, those, and there are those who believe say, who are saved through the power of the Holy Spirit. As he wrote earlier in his letter to the Galatians at the beginning of chapter three, before your very eyes, Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? There are no works to be done to be able to believe. Last week, Pastor Josh read a verse from the book of 1 Peter. To whom did Peter write this letter? Well, in the, first book of that, in the first verse of that book, he writes, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All of that compromising, uh, making up largely modern-day Turkey. And then in chapter 2, verse 10, he says, Once you were not a people but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When the time was right and had fully come, God presented his son as redeemer to the damaged and broken Galatians. Once they were not a people, but now they were children of God. They had not received mercy, Now they have received mercy. Why? The only reason was that they believed. Does this resonate with you? Because God also presents his son as redeemer to the damaged and broken you. Now for many of you sitting here today, this was an event of the past. Somewhere in your life, as it says in the Belgic Confession, you were completely miserable in the flesh, even though you probably didn't even know it. You were fleeing from him, even though you probably didn't know it. You might have been 14 years old, 24 years old, 80 years old. Our innate nature is to rebel against God. We're all conceived in sin, born into it, and can't help but do it. But God, when the set time had fully come, he called you unto himself, and you accepted, and you believed. Now for some of you, that time had not come until this morning. For some, perhaps it's come and gone before, but here it is again today. You sit here because a part of God's working in your life through his spirit and unbeknownst to you was to have you walk in through the doors today to hear his word for you. Today is your day. Do not leave here without acting on this that resonates with you. It is God's spirit nudging your heart. After the service, you can come to this corner to talk to someone. I will be there, and I'm gonna ask a prayer partner and an elder to join me there. But come and talk, just come. The amazing thing about a Christian life is that Jesus does not come to us once to find and save us and then leave us to our own devices. He is Emmanuel, God with us, That's a constant, not a one-time thing. Once we're his child, he stays and pours out gifts and blessings. He's there when we go to sleep and when we rise. He's there in our comings and our goings. He's there in all the ups and downs in your life. Every step, every breath, 
every decision. He is there when we cry out to him and when we call. As it says in Psalm 17, verse 6, 38, verse 15, 65, verse 2, 91, verse 15, 118, verse 21, and so many other places. He hears and will never leave or forsake us. So, what did we hear today? The time was set. It was set before the creation of the world that Jesus would die for us. The time of his death was set. The manner of his death was set. The people who orchestrated it was set. His burial, resurrection, transfiguration, ascension, all predestined, all preplanned, intentional. Jesus the Redeemer came when the time was right. And when the time was right, God brought the gospel to the Galatians, the gospel of grace and redemption. Jesus died for them too, to rescue them from this evil age, as it says in Galatians 1, 3, and 4, and to redeem them into sonship. They became God's children. And as we heard earlier, they were ready for that change. And so was the time set in which God brought you unto himself. God presented his son to you as your savior. He set out to find you because you were completely miserable and fleeing from him. The thing is, we all Adam and Eve, the Galatians, me, you, we all come to him in unworthiness. At the time of the first Passover, when the angel of death went to the homes of the Israelites, he didn't look to see who was worthy or unworthy inside the house. He just saw the blood on the door. If you think you're unworthy, God still just looks at the blood that was shed for you. That is amazing grace. And grace is available to all who choose him. There is no need to be who you once were or who you think you are. And as we're about to sing soon, you are who God says you are. Next week is the first week of Advent. We begin to focus more intentionally on the birth of Jesus, our Redeemer. At the beginning of this message, I, op- I mention an open and shut case. Join us as we look at the theme of Advent through the setting of a court case. In a way, we see another fullness of time here as many of us eagerly await the coming of Christmas Day our celebration of God sending his son Jesus into the world and offering his own people, sorry, coming into the world and offering people redemption to those who are hopelessly entangled in sin. Just like Adam and Eve, the Galatians, you and I today, we all need his amazing grace. Let's pray. God, we thank you that your word is for us. And God, we never, ever have to be worthy to receive your blessing, your word, and your grace. I thank you that we could see how you came to an evil and dark people called the Galatians and brought them redemption and hope. Pray, God, that you, we thank you that you continue to do that work. And I pray for everyone here, God, that we would know, God, that you never leave or forsake and that your grace is forever, ever pouring out over us. I thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.